Bea is the other of the two relationships that May invests in as she retreats home from college. The two of them were friends prior to her leaving, but only to an extent. Their relationship was strained. By spending time with Bea, May is learning about two forms of ontology, both relational and foundational ontology. The relational ontology is built on her relationships with other people, meaning is being brought back into said relationships. The foundational ontology could be understood as being a worldview. It is the philosophy by which meaning is given to an object. The ideas that May learns in Bea's relationship lay a groundwork for May to potentially restructure the world into a new and stable ontology. In order for the new relationship between May and Bea to begin to form, May has to move past her outdated view of their relationship. This process is mostly undergone in the beginning of the game. After having gotten drunk and made a fool of herself at the party in the woods, Bea drives May home. In the process, May asks Bea, and this is paraphrased, Remember when I used to call you BB and you called me Mayday? As was discussed in the first video, this is May expressing her view of the relationship between herself and Bea. She believes that the two of them are still as close of friends as they were when they were 10. However, Bea dashes any hopes of the relationship actually playing out as such when she responds, Oh, you mean when we were like 10? No, I don't. With Bea's denial of even as little as a memory of the relationship that May is trying to tap into, any potential to pick up where their relationship left off is dashed. May is forced to come to terms with the fact that her old understanding of their relationship is useless. May then has to determine where their relationship actually stands. The relationship between Bea and May becomes aggressive. The majority of the aggression comes from Bea for two reasons. One is that May has abandoned college, which is an opportunity that Bea would have killed for. It is understandable how watching someone throw away your wildest dreams would breed animosity. The problem is only compounded by the fact that May will not discuss why she left college. On the part of Bea, May's actions were nothing but wanton disregard for the consequences of her actions. The other source is more subtle. Bea is actually jealous of May for her relative freedom. In response to May telling Bea more or less to quit her job, Bea responds with, a lot of times people do things they do because they can't do anything else. As is clear at the time, this is an expression of how Bea feels about her current situation. She feels trapped by a grieving father and commitments to the family store. Soon after, she notes that Greg is likely off doing God knows what wacky stuff right now, in a rather envious fashion. May and Greg have a carefree life that Bea sees as an escape from her life of dinner and payroll. The aggression that Bea feels towards May acts as a relational blockage, preventing their relationship from progressing until it is addressed. It would seem at this point that an amiable relationship cannot exist between May and Bea. However, that is far from the truth. Their relationship changes dramatically during the chapter Proximity. In this chapter, May and Bea go to a party where May ruins Bea's chances of feeling like a normal teenager for a night. The first step in the relational change comes when May fails Bea. The specific failure in question is when May reveals to the partygoers that Bea is both not a college student and lives in Possum Springs. May reveals this information as an attempt to help Bea initially. The pieces of information that May reveals are all information that Bea was otherwise trying to deceive the students with. This is why May will later ask Bea how this is normal. To act in a normal manner for May is to be yourself. In this manner, May is actually trying perhaps inadvertently, but still, to help Bea by not allowing her to live a lie. This of course backfires as Bay is committed to the party in a manner that May is not able to discern prior to making the mistake. Despite having caused Bea a significant amount of distress, May's mistake really is the first step in solidifying their relationship. By making such a serious mistake during the party, May put Bea in a vulnerable state. She is vulnerable because of the disempowerment of not only being outed by May, but also having to run from the difficulty of the situation. This is the only time that Bea is shown in a position of weakness relative to May in the entire game, and all because of a little truth. Her vulnerability opens her to a reconsideration of her relationship with May. The first step in said reconsideration is forgiveness. 
The forgiveness that is necessary is not forgiveness for ruining the party, but what has stopped their relationship from forming existed prior to the night's faux pas. The blockage in their relationship is Bea's resentment for May dropping out of college, as I've stated previously. While this grievance had been aired earlier during the chapter of the party, it was hardly dealt with. May was in no state to be able to process that conversation. Now, however, Bea is able to bring to the forefront her grievances by presenting the resentment directly to May. With their grievances aired, the blockage in their relationship has at least been mitigated to the extent that they can progress forward. The full issue will not be resolved until and if May tells Bea exactly why she left school, but their relationship is at least able to move from being defined by Bea's resentment to being open for interpretation. May presents that their relationship is based upon proximity, which, while that is true to an extent, does seem to underplay their connection. Each character needs the other to escape a crippling aspect of themselves. May is helping Bea to escape the monotony and dread of her trapped life, while Bea tries to push May towards a more structured and sustainable existence. While those relationships are a bit beyond the scope of this particular argument, it is certainly the case that proximity is not the only factor in their relationship. Relationship. Regardless, by finally removing the relational blockage, Bea and May are able to redefine their relationship on grounds that are neither rooted in the past nor resentment, thereby allowing a new relational ontology to form between the two of them. On top of a new relational ontology, Bea presents May with a new foundational ontology that is based off of duty. Bea's work life is starkly juxtaposed to May's carefree life throughout the game. Whilst both of their lifestyles have pluses and minuses, a major deficiency of May's is its lack of stability. Bea points this out quite bluntly when she says that May is always running around messing with people and taking whatever you want while the whole mall is falling apart around you. While this statement is strictly about May's shoplifting in Fort Lucerne, it is also addressing May's instability. Shoplifting actually ends up being an excellent example of May's lifestyle. If one is to steal from a store, they do it out of an impulse to have the thing that they are stealing. They would then get the good and be content. However, the shoplifter also harms the business, thereby putting at risk the source of the goods that the shoplifter is interested in. May has shown throughout most of the game that she acts strongly on her impulses. Like a shoplifter, May threatens the stability of the systems that allow her to be impulsive, such as how leaving college put her home life at risk. Bea's ontology of duty goes beyond simply her having duties to other entities. When Bea brings up the sketchy employee known as Creek, she says that he would not be fired not only because he's a good worker, but also because Creek's got a family and he needs the work. Bea is sympathetic to the duty that Creek has to provide for his family, regardless of his own misgivings. Thereby, Creek's duties to others give him value in Bea's ontology. Not only is value given, but it's enough value to overlook that he may be a serious threat to her. Now keep in mind that those are simply the ideas that Bea is trying to express to May, and not necessarily the ones that May adopts. The question of what May does with all of this information will be dealt with in the next episode. It is only necessary to keep in mind that Bea's ontology is a significant influence on May's decisions surrounding the end of the game. By interacting with Bea, May is given a new relational and foundational ontology. The relational ontology is accepted by May as the two of them are friends not only at the end of the game but also throughout. The foundational ontology is more problematic. While Bea's ontology certainly has the potential to give structure to May's otherwise unstructured life, her own experiences within the ontology hint at its flaws. While we have focused mostly on what Bea has given to May, as that is the focus of this discussion, it cannot be understated that there is an exchange between them. May gives Bea a means of escaping the most soul-crushing portions of her ontology by removing some of Bea's order. Regardless, all of these ideas need to be kept in mind. In the next episode, we will look at what May actually does in response to these two relationships. But for now, thanks for watching and, as always, enjoy the rest of your day.